just look out. Here comes Monsignor. Welcome to the JDV Productions Podcast. No trouble Robin. here on the front stretch. One car hard in the outside wall. Interviews with the biggest stars. Man, I, I, I can't give it up enough to this team, uh, but especially Tommy Baldwin, man. I've had a lot of fun with him over the years, and it's just getting better. Go behind the scenes. In-depth storytelling. Catch up on all things JDV. Yeah, there are JVD Productions and Josh Maneda. Uh, the JDV Productions Podcast. Your champion. Starts now. Welcome back to Episode 5 of the JDV Productions Podcast. My name is Josh Veneta, CEO and promoter of JDV Productions, and I'm your host. Today I am joined by, I'm really not sure actually how to introduce him because he wears so many different hats uh, in the local racing scene, but I'm joined by the one and only Kyle Souza. Welcome to the podcast, bud. Hey, Josh. Thanks for having me on. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to some race chat, getting closer to that race season. It seems like it's uh, less than a month away just about now, so... I know. Don't remind me. I was talking with my wife this morning, just like you're at that point of the preseason prep where, you know, you cross five things off the list, but you added 15 in the same day. So even though you got things done, the list is still, it's not growing, it's multiplying. Yeah. It's only going to get worse. Believe me. I I feel the pain. (laughs) Well, Kyle, I, you know, we like to begin the same way with everybody, which is to just um, share a little bit about how you got involved in motorsports. So share with our listeners how you got the itch. Yeah, listening to some of the other podcasts, I think my story is kind of similar um, with the family connection. Uh, certainly grew up in the sport. Uh, my dad's been involved in racing definitely longer than I've been alive um, for most of his life as well. Uh, actually toured the cup scene for a while with Jeff Bodine. So um, when I was born, uh, I actually got my name from Kyle Petty. They named me after Kyle Petty. Um, and then we started going to races when I was pretty young, um, you know, Seekonk Weekly, um, and that kind of evolved from there. Loved it. Uh, used to bring the small set of flags to the track and, and flag in the stands. Um, and then got a job there. Um, literally right when I could get a job in Massachusetts, there was some type of uh, war or something in place. I had to have a permit to work. I remember going to get it. Um, and I started there and it just kind of spiraled from there. Um, so I've actually been at the track now. I tried to figure this out the other day, but it's been almost 15 years. So um Time goes by really, really quick, um, but definitely a family connection and still a family thing. Try to take my dad with me as far as I go because um, he took me when I was a kid. So we enjoy going together and, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, family connection for a lot of people. But I, I, I share the similar story. Yeah, and we actually share the same home track, which is Seekonk yeah. Speedway. It's where I grew up. My brother uh, still races there. He was the Triple Crown champion in 2023. Uh, and came up a runner up uh, to Rick Martin uh, for the sport truck championship. So um, uh, Kyle, I'm not really sure where to, begin, where to begin on everything you do. I think maybe we'll just say that I think, so you're, you're still an active to some degree in the officiating side. I know you're the race director um, on the Friday nights for some of the divisions for Seekonk's fast Friday, Friday program. Um, but I think most people have gotten to know you through your business, Susan Media. Yeah, um, I, like I said, I've been involved in Seekonk 15 or so years. Um, really taking the race director role for me is just the next step. Um, I've been involved in the officiating for just about all 15 years in some capacity, whether it be on the flag stand or watching races on the back straightaway with a radio, helping to make calls. Um, so not really too much of a jump for me. I know it's a title, but uh, something I've been doing for a long time. Um, involved at the track as well in the PR department with Ed and, and the team we have over there. Uh, social media stories. Um, certainly love doing that. Uh, and then, yeah, a lot of people will know me through the business. Um, started the business during COVID. Uh, somehow I kept it alive during no racing, a very limited amount of racing. I think the tour had eight or nine races that year. Um, we didn't have any races really at Seekonk at all due to the restrictions. Um, but it started there. Uh, I've told the story a few times, but the first guy when I kind of said I was going to start it to make the phone call was Justin Bonsignor. Um, and I give him all the credit in the world for giving me a shot. He helped me get going. Um, and I kind of had a full circle with him a couple of weeks ago down to Daytona to be with him at Daytona for his ARCA debut. So, um, enjoy working with him a lot. Been with him since the beginning, had some great clients along the way that are no longer with me. Stan Mertz just retired, was a client right from the beginning as well. Uh, and I've had other clients that have been with me from day one that are still with me. And I've picked up a bunch of new clients as well. So, 
Um, certainly a fun environment to be around in racing. Um, I tell people all the time, the drivers and the team spend money in racing and somehow I'm able to make money in racing, which is not a, uh, an easy thing to do, I think, these days. Um, so definitely really enjoy that. Definitely really busy. Uh, this off season was probably the busiest of my life. Um, and I think the other thing that people may or may not know about me is I do have a full-time job. Um, I do work full-time for iRacing um, in their race control department. Uh, so I'm one of the stewards there that kind of assesses incidents and makes suspensions if we have to or um, stuff like that. So I, I do do that during the day as well. So I do wear a lot of hats. I am a husband as well. Um, so it's uh, it's certainly busy. And like I said, the race season coming up here, it's definitely uh, going to get even busier, as I know it will for you and everybody else. But uh, I love it. Enjoy the sport. Enjoy the people more than anything. And I think you as somebody that's been to multiple different tracks and dealt with a lot of people in racing will probably share a similar uh, assessment that to me, it's about the people, the relationships you build and, and the enjoyment we have at the races. It is, yeah, it's certainly a, a community and Kyle deserves uh, much of the credit for building the JDB Productions platform. Uh, prior to the season, he had done uh, all of our digital media um, and would still be doing it, um, save for the fact that we're going into um, you know, our new endeavor at Monadnock Speedway and Kyle's uh, and Seekonk every Saturday night. So, um, you know, really grateful for all the work that he's done to boost our engagement and um, bring national quality um, media to uh, to all of our fans. So, uh, but Kyle, let's talk a little bit because you've made a big dent in the modified world. Um, that's where a lot of your clients are. I think everybody knows that I'm a huge fan of short track racing, but my heart has been with the modifieds for, um, you know, since I remember going to the races and now even in, in my career as, as a promoter. So. There's a lot of excitement in the modified space. Um, you can pretty much race at least once a week if you want to in a tour type modified, uh, at least. Although I think in the past two years, that schedule has kind of moderated, which um, I think that's probably for the best. I think we have kind of hit that point where, um, okay, we're, we're reaching the law of diminishing returns here, where your car counts are going down because of the number of races we have, not up. Um, but talk a little bit about kind of just like, give us a preview. What are some of the highlights you're seeing in tour type modified competition these days? Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, the assessment with the scheduling, uh, I think two or three years ago was definitely overloaded. Um, I, I think the reality of it is it's good for the race teams. There, there's some value options out there that you can run, uh, whether you want to run a touring series style pit stop race, whether you want to run a short track weekly environment with an SK modified uh, or you want to run some open modified racing that really the person open modified racing is is pretty good um, for the environment. So I, I think there's a lot of races out there. Uh, I've said over the last couple of years, I don't know that it's the best thing for some of the fans that might be listening, because obviously it costs money to get into the tracks. And it's tough for me to make a schedule where I want to go uh, to work, never mind for some of the fans. Um, but I do think it's gotten better here rolling into 2024. I think you've seen some of the divisions kind of rework their scheduling uh, and in weird ways, I think, work with each other to see what another division put out for a schedule and try to book around that so there's not conflictions for some of these teams that want to run um, all of them. So I think the general sentiment is it's gotten better, and I think the general sentiment with some of these teams is they have a lot of options, and they're going to run a lot more races than they've probably ever run in their life. Um, and they've had done that here the last couple of years. Um, but, you know, starting with the tour, I think, obviously, the, the competition level there at the top is, is really tough. Um, we saw Justin and, and Ronnie Silk duel it out heavily last year, uh, kind of been brewing since Silk came back as a heavy favorite with the 16 team the year before. It, you know, he was not winning a lot, but it was running in the front and showing, uh, you know, he was going to be a threat. Uh, and then last year, it kind of came to fruition with him and Justin really duking it out there uh, for the enjoyment of the fans. Uh, got rough at times. I've talked to both of them about it. They know it. Um, but you know, they never spun each other out. They just raced each other really hard. I think in their words, maybe too hard at some times, um, you know, Ronnie winning the championship came down to the final couple laps, uh, which I think is great for the series, uh, great for the sport. Uh, and we were just talking off the air before getting on, uh, there's a couple other guys that are really stepped up here that, that are probably going to be a threat with them this year. Austin beers, uh, has jumped in there with the 64 team, really got his feet wet last year. Uh, and I think some of the year before, too, at the end of the year. And uh, he's going to be a major threat for this championship uh, if he can keep the consistency going. He's got speed at every track. Uh, but, Josh, as you and I both know, comes down to the pit stops. 
having a good pit crew, not making mistakes on pit road. Uh, and I think a lot of these tour races right now, the guy that gets out front in the second half of the race, he might win the race. The cars are uh, pretty equal between some of these fast cars. Uh, and talking to Justin after New Smyrna, they had a 15 or 20 lap run to the finish there on fresh tires. They're so even on fresh tires. It's so hard uh, to make ground. Uh, you got other guys, you know, Doug Kobe running a part-time schedule this year uh, with Tommy Baldwin and his team. Tommy's focusing on his cup stuff this year uh, um, with Rick Ware Racing, but Doug's always a threat when he goes out there. Uh, obviously, six-time champion, no introduction needed there. He's a major threat. Uh, you've got the 58 car this year with two drivers, Eric Goodale, Timmy Salamito. Uh, I know those guys are going to be a threat just about everywhere they go. Jake Johnson in the Bowler 3 car, major threat running in the front. And then you get that Matt Hirschman guy runs, you know, good half to a little bit more than half of the races. Always a threat. Uh, Ryan Priest jumping in and out uh, from the Cup Series to run some modified racing this year. The health of that tour with the competition level on the front end is is really exciting for the fans. Uh, if you go to a modified race and you're watching Matt Hirschman, Ryan Priest, Justin Bonsignor, Ronnie Silk battle it out, uh, plus a bunch of other guys I didn't mention, um, the competition level is certainly really high there at the front. And uh, I think they're racing and that championship is going to come down to the wire. And I would say, you know, if it got rough last year, I would expect there to be some interesting moments this year as well uh, with a little bit of a shorter schedule too, that the points are going to matter more and more as we get to the second half of the season. So uh, definitely an exciting time to watch a modified tour race. I'll put it that way. Yeah, I think you're right about that. And it's interesting with the pit stops, you know, you had 200 laps down at New Smyrna. So there were two pit cycles that would happen during the course of that race and i think you did see in some ways the teams that had more experienced pit crews or were able to execute better on pit road were the teams that were running in the front and contending for the win um i think i had i had posted after the that race though that it looked like much of 2023 had continued it was ron silk and justin bonson you are at the front um and both had interesting moments i mean you're, you're right to point out that they raced each other extremely aggressively in the last half of 2023 uh, but both had interesting moments one of those happening at the winchester fair for ronnie silk in which he spun uh on the op on the opening start short pitted and i think that's the value of a veteran crew chief like a phil moran who just kept the team calm they kept making the changes they needed to they'd come in under every yellow and do what they needed to do and they were able to salvage a halfway decent finish out of it um and, you know, Justin's team, obviously, with Ryan Stone as the crew chief, they're, vet, they're seasoned and three-time champion as well. Um, so it, looking forward to, to seeing how all of that shakes out for New Englanders, which is where most of our race fans are listening from. They're actually going to have eight opportunities this year to see the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour. There will be three stops at Thompson Speedway Motorsports Park. There'll be the traditional stop at New Hampshire Motor Speedway, which is now moving from July to June. There'll be the traditional stop at Seekonk Speedway um, in early June, and then there'll be three stops at our home track, um, which is Monadnock Speedway, opening on May 4th with the Grand State Derby as a 150-lap race on the brand-new pavement. Second race will be the Duel of the Dog, this year 250 laps with a pit stop. And then the last race, of course, being the Winchester Fair, back to the traditional distance of 200 laps. So... Um, it's going to be interesting, Kyle. I don't know if you've been to some of the Riverhead races where there have been pit stops or whatnot. On a quarter-mile racetrack, we're going to have a controlled caution. Um, from a from a, a sports media standpoint, what do you think about that that uh, setup? Yeah, it's uh, when they first said they were going to do pit stops in the infield at Riverhead, I was like, that doesn't seem like a good idea. That seems like a disaster. Uh, and then I saw the setup kind of in photos and then got there for the race, and I was like, wow, this is actually – way better than I expected. Uh, not that I don't have faith in promoters and people that come up with plans, but sometimes somebody comes up with a plan and I feel like it may not work too well. Um, but in that case at Riverhead, it worked really well. Uh, it actually put on a really good race. They had a 256 lap race, I think the first year they ran it. Uh, really long race too. Uh, and it, it was came down right to the end. So um, very interested to see Manadnock and that pavement. Uh, I've seen a lot of pictures of it. Excited to get there in May uh, for that first race and very excited to see how it races. Uh, um, especially with these modifieds and the how well they are to the ground. Uh, and I'm sure there's been some changes in the, the elevations and the bumps in the track might be gone in some places. Uh, so specifically thinking of Manadnock, especially that first one in May, I think it's very likely you might see a driver catch that pavement and run in the front that we may not have expected 
uh, to have a shot at winning. It might just take hitting the setup on that day when everybody else is trying to catch up. Um, don't get me wrong. I know Ronnie Silk, Justin Bonsignor, Austin Beers. Uh, they'll be fast. They'll be up there in contention. But uh, for the race fans, would not be surprised to see somebody they may not have expected running up there. I'm sure they'll figure it out by the time they get there in July for that big race um, with the pit stop and everything that's going to come with that. That adds a whole new element to Manadnock uh, that I think may throw some of the teams off guard. So that also adds some excitement for the fans. Uh, and then when they come back to you in September for that final race, it's crunch time. I mean, there's three or four races left in the season. Uh, and I kind of touched on it earlier, but with the tour running three or four less races this year, the points matter in every single race. Not that they didn't last year, but when you look at the points and the schedule for this year, if you have a couple of gremlins, you may not be in contention. Last year, I think each driver, Silk and Justin, had one or two. But if you have more than that, you're going to knock yourself out of contention. You have to be consistent uh, because you mentioned it. Phil Moran with Ronnie Silk, Ryan Stone with Justin Bonsignor, uh, Sly Sabin's a major part of the 64 now. These are guys that have been around a long time know how to prepare a car, know how to have it ready for competition, and know how to be consistent and get to the end of a race and get the best finish possible, and they have great drivers. So um, I'm really interested to see how it goes. I know you know the new Smyrna today is still a while to go here before we get to Richmond for the second race of the season. I was disappointed to see we had to wait so long uh, in between races, but it is February. It is very early in the season, uh, so I get it. But uh, looking forward to seeing how that tour goes this year. There's so many competitors there uh, and so many teams that I think could have a shot at winning. So it's going to be interesting. In our conversation earlier with Jimmy Wilson, he had indicated that in his conver his conversations with race teams over the course of the winter, that he is, he is seeing um, a kind of a return to that 15 to 20 full-time race teams as a result of the schedule adjustments this year, which will be really interesting because we opened 2023 um, for JDD Productions with 30 NASCAR wheel and modified tour cars at Manadnock. So we're looking to see a repeat of that um, in 2024 when we open um, for the Granite State Derby. Uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. I know that you have multiple clients on the tour, but if we were to ask you to pick who you think the 2024 tour champion would be, who would you pick? That's yeah, tough. Uh, to me, it comes down to those three drivers I mentioned, Silk, Bonsignor, and Beers. I think they're the, the three top teams uh, as far as that consistency, the three, you know, three of the top drivers. Um, I, I just have trouble betting against Bonsignor and that 51. Uh, I think they have a little bit of frustration still over last year. I feel like they, uh, they had a good shot at it, didn't come to fruition. They thought they had their fourth championship in their grasp. Uh, I think they're going to come back in a big way this year. Ronnie came out really strong. Uh, and just because I'm picking Justin, it's going to go down right to those final laps at Martinsville. Uh, I think you're looking at that again this year. Uh, and, you know, Ryan Priest jumped in there last year and won that race at Martinsville, but Justin was the second best car. So he's going to go back there with a lot of confidence. Uh, and some people say, well, Ronnie was only sixth or seventh. That's really all he needed to do to win the championship. People race a little bit differently when they know they need to finish in a certain spot to seal the points and all the money that comes with that, uh, the bonus points and everything throughout the year. So uh, I'm picking the 51. I'm not going to be surprised at all, though, if that final race comes down to those three drivers on points uh, coming close together. There's probably somebody else out there, too, that's going to surprise everybody and be a contender. Uh, Kyle Bonsignor been on and off in his career. If he can put it together, he can be there. Don't count out Jake Johnson in that three. I think he's a young driver that's got a lot of ambition uh, and a lot of speed at times. So I'm going to 51. Somebody's going to write this down now in March that I'm picking the tour champion. Uh, Justin's a new dad, too. I think that's given him a little bit of a uh, push as well. Uh, but I think they're both going to win a lot of races. I think Austin Beer's going to win a lot of races. Uh, and I think New Englanders are going to hear those three names over and over. We're going to shove those three names down your throat. Uh, you're going to see them a lot in the JDB Productions page, I'm sure, too, leading into the Monadnock races because those are the three guys that everybody's going to be watching as the season goes along. Absolutely. You can purchase your tickets for the Grand State Derby on May the 4th on monadnockspeedway.com. That link is live, so you can be sure to make sure you take you can take advantage of that and skip the lines without any waiting. Kyle, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. If somebody wanted to learn more about Susan Media or their race team listening and they wanted to know how they could get in touch with you to have you promote their brand, how could they do that? Yeah, definitely can visit us online, kylesouza.com. It's Sousa with a Z. I know that's... Uh... 
on and off thing in the uh, racing world. Um, they can also follow us on Facebook, Susa Media. We're on Twitter as well. Definitely send me a personal message too. Any way to reach out to me that you can find is good for me. Uh, I have a great client list for this year. Uh, every year we kind of few go out, few come in, um, but we we really work with some great people like yourself over the years uh, and had some great opportunities and looking forward to hopefully growing it even more here as uh, life moves on into the future. Fantastic. Well, thanks for your time today. We're also incredibly grateful for the work that you've done for us over the years. And obviously, Kyle, as you can tell, remains a dear friend of JDB Productions. He'll be at the Granite State Derby uh, in May for the, uh, the at least NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour's first event on our new pavement. For more information about JDV Productions, you can visit our website at jdvproductions.com or you can visit monadnockspeedway.com for the latest information on the quarter mile oval in Winchester. Thanks again for listening in. We'll be back next week with another episode of the JDB Productions podcast.